Hey everybody, this is Casey Miller here for another episode of Facebook Live. Um, thanks to all of you who are tuning in, um, whether you're a Chicago Fire fan, an MLS fan, um, in the Positive Coaching Alliance community, um, if you're tuning in from the PCA Chicago page, um, welcome and um, thank you for joining us for this week's episode with Michael Azira. Um, we are super excited to have um, Michael with us today. He is a current player for the Chicago Fire of the MLS in Chicago, and he has made his way. He grew up in Uganda, played college soccer in Kentucky and Alabama, and worked his way up to now be in the MLS, had played for uh, the Seattle Sounders, and is now again with um, the Chicago Fire, which is where we have a positive coaching line Chicago chapter. So we're super excited for this conversation with Michael for the next uh, 30 or so minutes. And so if you're joining, um, let us know where you're watching from. If you have any questions for Michael, um, please feel free to chat them in. I'll be following along. Um, he has a pretty fascinating background and story that I think you all will enjoy learning about. And so um, welcome and let's let's get started. So thanks for joining us, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me today. It's I truly appreciate for taking the time and inviting me to you to your program and you. I'm really excited and I look forward to sharing my story with the guys. Amazing. Love it. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, going back to when you um, were born and raised, you grew up in Uganda. Um, tell us about about your your upbringing and your childhood there. Uh, I would say it's, I loved it, you know, because we grew up in a in a family of eight, and I'm the second last. And mostly soccer is played everywhere. Soccer is the major sport in my country, so we we know everyone in the community. We every time we came from school at four p.m., we all gather each other and we play soccer. And we used to play. We didn't have a lot of fields, mostly because of everyone plays soccer, so every soccer field is occupied. So every space we could find, we could just play. So we used to play in the middle of the road. We put the bricks on each side. We had to make our own balls out of plastic bags. And when the car comes, we stop, the car goes, and then we play again. But um, all my brothers played soccer, and my dad used to play as well. Because I remember they used to, <laughs> they used to take me to school when I was little. And as soon as they drove me in class, I just run out of class and I go on my father's field. Because oh, my dad, when, as I said, my dad used to play soccer. So my dad used to, the way they used to train was the field was next to us. So I would just go chase balls around the field. And <laughs> But later, you know, I realized the importance of school and I started going to school. And But I grew up in a in a ghetto area, kind of. It's, it's in the city, but it's the ghetto area. So there was a lot of crime and stuff like that, but me getting involved in soccer kept me out of trouble a lot, and that has been my way out ever since. And since playing soccer, I've been I've been able to stay out of trouble. And most of my friends, like a lot of good players, they got involved in a lot of things like drugs and gangs and stuff like that. It's the peer oppression stuff. But me, I used to go every weekend. My work at home was just to do dishes and bring water as soon as i do that i leave at 10 a.m i come back at 6 p.m in the evening like i don't come back i don't even i didn't even care about lunch i just used to play go find fields and play with my friends and we used to play without shoes and stuff like that and but my mom used to give me a little bit of like some change for breakfast so i saved all that money and to buy my first pair of boots and these were, I don't know, I should say explain, but this was the best thing ever to me. You know, saving my own money and buying my own boots. It, I used to wear them going to school, coming back, I keep, I never, I, I used never to put them off. Cause like, you know, it helped me so much that, you know, I stopped, you know, you know, bruising my feet and kicking my nails out. So, but you know, it, I, I appreciate my parents, what they did for us and, and to be able to put food on the table. And ever since, I usually found scholarships to go to school. My parents couldn't afford it. So I found scholarships here and there playing soccer. And even coming to the U.S., I found a scholarship as well. But, right. and, and I was going to ask, so it, was, um, it sounds like, you know, your childhood and growing up, there was a ton of free play, which 
I'm sure as you've seen or heard, you know, in the US, oftentimes everything's so hyper organized with people structuring play and putting together teams. And you had the opportunity to have that amazing experience of free play just out in the street and playing with your friends. And when, what, how old were you when you first got introduced to, you know, like an organized team with a coach? At what, at what age did that start for you in Uganda? I was around 13 years old, 13, 14 years old. That's when I joined the team, I joined an, I, an academy kind of. And that's when I started joining the really organized soccer, but real, still I didn't play, you know, because they called me, they invited me to go play. They liked me there. So I went and played for free as well. So then from there I played to, I played all the way to the first team and before it became a pro league. So I played there and and then that's when a friend we used to go to high school with Henry Kalunji is in lives in Charlotte now. He started an academy, Alpha Soccer Academy, and he recommended me to his team, to his coach here in Winthrop. To he told me, you know, I, I have a friend in Uganda. I think it would be a good player to come play at Winthrop. So the coach flew all the way from Winthrop to come see me in Uganda to watch me play. So he really liked me, and then he offered me a scholarship. <laughs> So it was a friend that was already playing. So I was going to ask, how from Uganda did you then get recruited to go play in um, the, the first school was in Kentucky, right? Yeah. And so you had a friend that was already playing on the team and they suggested to the coach to, to check you out. And the coach said, OK, I'll fly to Uganda and watch. Yeah, yeah, because he did well for the school. He, he did well for Winthrop University in South Carolina. So I was supposed to go to Winthrop in South Carolina. But like as I said, oh, yeah, my parents couldn't afford education and stuff like that. So when I got this this scholarship, I didn't tell anyone. I kept it to myself till the last day that I was leaving. The, till the last day I left, or the day before. That's when I told my mom that I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> she didn't know anything. So before you were <laughs> leaving to go to college on a scholarship, you didn't tell her until the day before? Yeah. I didn't tell her. I kept everything to myself. And she was How really shocked. Up? And <laughs> you know, it's, it's just the way things are done back home, you know, until something really happens. And then that's when you're like, okay, I'll tell people. Because I didn't want them to, you know, my mom to be really like worried or like to be like, oh my God, what can I do for you? Because even that day when I told her, she, she told me, my God, what can I do for you? Is there anything I can do for I'm like, mom, you have no money. It's okay. You know, because even the tick, the ticket that brought me to the U.S., someone else bought it for me. His name is Mr. Ken Davis. He was working for World Food Program. He paid for my school, for high school. He paid for my high school. So when I told him that I found a scholarship, he is like he looked into it, and he, when he found out it's, it's true, he just bought my ticket. My mom didn't do anything. And even then, I was in I was in the national team. By then, they, I was young. They invited me. I usually go in just to shadow to see how the national team trains. So they were going to play a friendly game, but they wanted me to play. But to play international friendly, they need a passport. And my passport was at the embassy. <laughs> so the coach had selected me that day to play. And I told him, hey, coach, I don't think I can play my passport. And he's like, what are you talking about? You're supposed to play today. And your passport is not. I was like, yeah, it's not. So he asked me, where is it? I was like, I said, it's at the embassy. I got a scholarship. I'm going to go study. He's like, oh, okay. I'm happy for you, but you can always come back and, and play for the I was like, yes, thank you. So I had to leave the camp, and the media kept on writing in Uganda that I had escaped. But I, I had not escaped yet. I just got a scholarship. That's when my mom really saw it in the news. That's when she started asking me questions like, Michael, what is this? <laughs> I know, eh? That is crazy that you got away with getting a full ride scholarship and your plane ticket bought and everything, and you didn't say a peep to your family until the night before. No, I didn't tell anybody because. <laughs> but I'm story. really thankful. Yeah, it's. I'm thankful to Mr. Ken Davis who bought me my ticket. He's, he's been amazing in my life since I met him. Because when I first joined the academy team at 14, his son was playing with us as well. So he took us to Denmark to play in a tournament. And since then, I, that's the that's that's when really I connected with him, and he saw that I liked school, but I couldn't afford it, so he he paid it for he paid, he paid school for me. 
And when he found out I found a scholarship, I found a scholarship was really happy for me. And then when Henry recommended me to Winthrop and the coach came to Uganda to watch me play, he liked me offered me a scholarship. And then after that, the issue was my paperwork took long to be processed by the NCA clearing house. But I was already getting in the U.S. So the coach said, Michael, I'm going to send you to Kentucky. But, you know, if you're from Uganda, you come to the U.S., yeah, dude, you're like, this is it. Because in back home, you only see L.A., you only see New York, you know, these are the big cities you, you see. You thought you were going to a big city with yeah. <laughs> lots of things to like, do, yeah. and then you landed in where? Louisville? Where oh. did you land? So we came through Chicago. I was like, yes, I saw Chicago was beautiful. Like, so we, from from Chicago, we go, we went to Louisville. I was like, Louisville is not so bad. But like, I was so tired from the flight because it's like a 22, 23 hour flight. So I took a nap in the van. So to wake up, I saw deers running in front of the, of the van. I was like, where are we going? I didn't expect to see this because this, this is not what I see on TV back home in right. Uganda. Right. So I was like, this can't be right. <laughs> Wow. So we ended up in Columbia, Kentucky, it's in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> but as a child back home, I promised my mom that I would finish school before I, I would play. Because some teams wanted me to sign back home, but I told them, no, I'm going to go to school. So when I got to Lindsay Wilson's college, I was really, it was frustrating at the beginning. But then I remembered why I'm here. I came to finish school. So even though the place wasn't that great, the coach took a chance on me to give me a scholarship. So I was like, I'll take this opportunity and use it to change my life in any way that I can. So I stayed in Lindsay for three years and I wanted to leave school, but the coach wouldn't let me leave. He wanted me to stay. But, you know, we stayed at school. We didn't do anything on campus. We didn't have a job, you know, being an international student, like you need like campus job. We couldn't even afford our own, our own toiletry, you know, like, what are we doing here? So the coach really wanted us to just to play for him, you know, we loved soccer. That's true. But like with every weekend kids used to go home. So you stay on campus by yourself. Even in December time, you stay on campus by yourself. It was it was cold and you're like, oh, so it gets really boring and lonely. So I told him, I need to leave. I want to leave, but he would he would never let me go. Right. So I had to find ways of leaving Lindsay. So I found some information and I, I called University of Mobile. I told him, I'll transfer to your school if you just give me a job. <laughs> so he gave me, he said, yeah, cow, it's okay. So I, I went there. I looked at his school. And I was like, it was a Christian college, small college. I was like, that's fine. It's better than Lindsay because in Lindsay only uh, we had a, a Chinese restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, and nothing else around. I was yeah. like, so, when, so Mobile was a little bit, at least a little bit bigger and better and things to do. Yeah, so I was like, you know, I'm coming. So I came. I opened my job in the cafeteria. I used to work on Saturdays and Sundays, and then I used, I go to school from Monday to Friday. But after that, I got a job. In I, I found a coaching job as well. I coached a high school, and that was really great. And I bought my first laptop. <laughs> that was really cool. I could, because <laughs> I couldn't type. I, we didn't have computers back home. But the thing is, whenever I had a, a paper that is due Friday and there was five pages, I would start on Monday to type. <laughs> I would type slow till I make it. And Friday, I'll hand in my paper. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever yeah. it takes. Yeah. I type, I type a page a day, you know, <laughs> I was really slow in typing, but I go better with time, you know, <laughs> yep. I had some oh friends, you know, yeah, but you know, it all worked out for good. And then I graduated with my business degree in May, 2012. That was something, you know, for me and for my family, because I'm the only kid in my family was who managed to get an education and get a degree. My mom always wanted us to go to school, but she couldn't afford it. And when my brother didn't pass his exams, she wasn't really happy. So when I, I told I, I told her mom I'll finish school, but she always told me like I can't, I don't have money. I will lie for that. So I always told her mom, don't worry, something will work out. You know, and so like enough. Yeah, you know, Soka Soka gave me the way. You know, it gave me a path that I used to get my degree, and 
So I'm saying from Berlin to Sons College, you know, to take a chance on me and Winthrop University and my friend Henry and the coach at Winthrop because someone has to believe in you, man. If someone doesn't believe in you, it's it's hard. Right. So they believed in me. They gave me an opportunity to open a lot of doors for me. It's such an inspiring story. And I have, there's a few comments that um, came in. So Tyler Heffernan is watching. He said, shout out Columbia, Kentucky. Um, yeah. Molly Whitaker joined. Jason Sex. Amy is watching from Boulder, Colorado. George in New York. Christy in Chicago. Um, Brandon from, uh, he's in Toronto, Canada. He asked a question. So, you know, after college, you obviously ended up playing professionally. You're currently with the Chicago Fire, but you also played in Montreal. He um, he asked, "What is what was the biggest difference between playing in Montreal and then playing in the U.S.?" Um, there wasn't there wasn't a difference because because even in Montreal they had a lot of good players there because you know I got to a chance to play with Pieri, you know such a great player and there were a lot of a ton of good players there you know and the difference was just the language <laughs> you know they mostly mostly spoke French and. So I had to get used to the language a little bit and the money too is Canadian money. Yeah. <laughs> but besides that, you know, it's there's a lot of different cultures in Montreal. You know, people from all over the world and get to enjoy a lot of different kinds of cuisines and stuff like that. And it's a beautiful place in summer, besides winter. But there is no difference because you get to travel. We travel a lot. That's the difference as well because you always come back into the U.S. to play your game. And the only short flight we had was one going to DC and Toronto for the rest. Okay. Like, so that's the only thing. But it was thanks to everyone who is watching. <laughs> yeah. Tell them thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, guys. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that question, Brandon. And then I wanted to ask too, you know, Positive Coaching Alliance, obviously we, we train and we um, have curriculum for youth and high school coaches, and we try to maximize the amazing platform that sports are to teach life lessons. And um, I wanted to ask you, I know you've coached, I think it was U16, U18, different youth soccer teams. And I'm curious, you know, what your coaching philosophy is when you've coached youth teams and what you've tried to um, instill in your players when you were coaching them. Uh, to me, the first thing uh, I always, if, I, if I'm a coach, I always try to show to the players that I believe in them. Because, like as I said, if someone didn't believe in me, I wouldn't be here. So, and a lot of kids, a lot of players struggle with self-esteem, you know. You have to show them that you believe in them, that you believe in their dream, you know, whatever they want to achieve. But also the other thing that I look forward to is trying to find their full potential. Like, how can I help the kid? How can I enrich this kid, add value to this kid to see that he can go to where he needs to be. Or that sometimes we find issues with some of the kids that, you know, they don't want to try. You know, they have expectations. That really makes it difficult to coach. You know, because, you know, with the, not that I'm saying anything against pay to play system, but some parents or some Kids, when they pay money, they expect to be on the field, even though they train or they don't train. So that really makes it difficult to coach. You know, because, you know, they're like, oh, I pay my money, so you have to play me, you know. And and yet everything has to be earned, you know. Even though you pay your money, it still doesn't help if you just think that, you know, everything will be given to you on the silver plate. I feel like I try to encourage them as much as I can you know, try to see if they can reach their full potential. But at the end of the day, it's 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 up to them to be able to push hard and give their best to be able to reach their goals that they want to achieve in life, you know. But I try to enjoy every moment with the kids, build relationships and add value to them as much as I can. Yeah, and that's such a good point that you start with believing in them because someone believed in you, which has helped you get to where you are playing in the MLS, that starting at that baseline of showing belief in the players that you coach, I think is, a, is an awesome message to other coaches who are watching. Um, Emma, Emma Rovix wrote in and was wondering what it was like playing with Bastian, um, I, I think I'm going to mess up the last name, Schweisteiger, Bastian Schweisteiger. Yeah, Bastian, yeah. <laughs> She's uh, she's was, wondering what it was like playing with with him. 
Yeah, that was like, you know, dream come true because these are the guys you used to watch on TV back home. You know, you get to play with a guy who won a World Cup, won a Champions League, you know, and that's one thing I've said and that I really like. I'm really fortunate, you know, that I've been able to play with these guys, be on the same team and compete against them sometimes. And But Basti is such a great player that, you know, he's off, off the field, he's the goofiest guy ever. He's very funny. He... He's always smiling, you know, and, you know, he's he's always relaxed and he takes control when he's on the field. He's a leader. And so we got a chance to learn a lot from him. The way he sees the game is totally different compared to other players. So it was it was a blessing to me to be able to share the field with him. And, and I always cherish that because besides just being a good player, he's a good person as well because. Even once in a while, we still reach out. We reach out to each other and say hi. It's it's been amazing, and I bet it was great to everyone in the locker room and on the field as well. That's awesome. Good question, Emma. Um, Christy wrote in. She's she said you have an incredible story, Michael, and she's asking what lessons that you've learned in soccer do you plan to take with you after your time playing professionally? Mm, mostly. It's- Forgive, forgiving people. Uh, that's one thing that I, I feel like if you don't forgive people, you don't move on. Because playing, being, being a soccer player, you face so many challenges. You know, you're going to face so many obstacles. People trying to block your path, anything like that. They will do anything mean or anything like that. But at the end of the day, usually these people are acting out of insecurity and fear. And usually they act different when they they don't know you or something like that so usually those kind of people have learned that you know i should forgive them you know if i don't forgive them i won't move on in life because it's just another obstacle on my path that i need to go over so i can keep on chasing my dream and my goals so yeah <laughs> there's, there's somewhere you know i would try to transfer from a school and they and one of the one of the coaches told me, if you try to leave school, I'm going to deport you. That was really scary to me. And I was like, really? Why would you deport me just because I want to transfer to another school? So, but after I made it to MLS, he called me and he wanted this, a jersey. Because I would have turned him away. But he gave me an opportunity to give me a scholarship. He took a chance on me to give me to get an education. So I had to forgive him and give him a jersey no matter what. Cause, wow. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is hard work. You know, we, every day, you know, you have to give your best. You know, playing in MLS, it, it, there is no day that you come and you just say, you know, I'm going to give 60%. Because it's a competition. You're fighting for a spot. You're fighting to be on the team. You're fighting for your contract each and every day. So even in life, you know, like, I feel like we have to work for everything. You know, no matter where we go, no matter where we are, we have to continue to fight for what we want to achieve in life. You know, even after I play, I know I have to continue to work hard. I don't want, you know, I don't want, I'm not this kind of guy who just sit around, you know, oh, I played, I played in professional soccer. I'm supposed to get this, you know, and so those are the two things at work and forgiveness and, and just being, you know, loving, you know, being kind to other people is really important. It's, you have to be kind to other people because a lot of players come we, li- we work with a lot of players and some of them are in- new to an environment, you know, a lot of young kids and a lot of new players, like you have to treat them with respect and kindness and sh- f- make them feel welcome, you know, so, cause you never know, you know, cause you, if it's you, you want to be welcomed as well. Cause right. as you get traded a lot around the, around the league, I think it's very important to be welcomed, you know, with kindness and respect and love. So, Such a great message. Yeah, thank you. So I tried to carry those with me. Yeah. And then Ginny, um, Ginny Wolburn wrote in, she was wondering, she was asking if your family is still in Uganda and if you're able to go back and see them. And I'd love to, because this might lead into it, but just to talk a little bit about um, the Pearl of Africa Youth Organization that you started as well. Yeah, so... I get to go home almost every year because even also playing with the national team, it helps me out a lot to see them quite often. And also with the tournament, we 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 organize it every year. So we started with me and my friends. 
and I have other friends we went to school with back home. So we decided, you know, we need to come up with something that we can. These, these, these tournaments used to play in back home. They're not there anymore. So we're like, how can we get the kids engaged, but also trying to teach them about the importance of education? Because it's through education that we're able to be successful. So I usually I share my story with other kids, and also my friends share their stories, how they've been able to become successful. I know people define successful. Everyone defines it in a different way. But to me, if I can add value or help another kid go to the next level, to me, I feel good. I feel good about it. So we decided to do this tournament and we encourage kids to stay in school and tell them about the importance of school, something to fall forward on. You know, it, because soccer ends, soccer is what we do, it's not who we are. Soccer is going to end, but who we are will keep on going on, you know. So we try to teach them the value of education. That, you know, it's something to have in have around, you know. In case anything happens, you know, you can always go try to find a job and you know, it's it gives you like an upper hand when you're starting in life out of soccer. So we're trying to encourage them as much as we can, try to find them schools, try to find them scholars scholastic materials as much as we can. And so that gives an opportunity to see my family and to answer the question is my family or oh, my entire family is still back in Uganda. I only live here with my wife and my two kids. <laughs> Love it. And um, so last question as we wrap things up, you mentioned you have two kids. Um, I know they're a little bit young, four and two, so they're not necessarily in sports. But when you think about, you know, your upbringing as a youth athlete and now being a parent, seeing how your parents were with you, what kind of um, sports parent do you think that you'll strive to be and what values will you work to instill in your two kids in sports? <laughs> oh, man, that's really, really, that's the hardest part, you know, when it comes to your own kids, you know. Because as much as I want them, I want my boy to play soccer, because even after, like, usually after games, I used to take them on the field and kick around. He's, I don't think he's going to go that on, in that path. And I need to accept that, you know, that, you know, because he loves soccer. No, he loves, he just he loves me to, he, he loves to watch me play, but he mostly loves swimming. He loves to swim a lot. So that is something that I look forward to. And I don't know what the girl is going to turn out to be, but she kicks around, you know, once in a while. But, you know, I want to teach them, you know, that they need to work hard for, for everything, you know. it's Nothing is going to be handed out to them. You know, they need to work for whatever they want to achieve. And also, the same is it the same size doesn't fit all. They need to create their own path. You know, they don't need to follow, you know, somebody or someone did this to become successful. They, they need to make create their own path to be successful. Because I've learned that when my wife and I were trying to teach him in the mornings, because now I've been able to see this. Right. My wife has been great in terms of teaching them in the morning. So I've been able to be around and learn how they teach, teach, it, teach them. Because when you try to, when you come to him and you tell him, hey, Gabriel, it's time for school, it, re it makes him really nervous. But like you find ways that things things that excite excites him and he likes wild animals. So he likes so if you can create wild animals in terms of numbers, you put numbers on them and make it fun, that it makes him ex it gets him excited and he will be really you pay attention to that. So I've learned that, you know, we the teaching is it shouldn't be the same to everybody, you know. There are different ways we can teach. We can create curriculums which fit kind of or the type of kids that we have and so I'm, I'm glad that I, I know this lockdown is is too much right now but it has given me an opportunity to see the other side of my kid of how can I teach him of how can I be a better father to him you know so that he can reach where he wants to be but he needs to make his own path that that he wants he want I want I want him to pursue what he wants to pursue and I will support him absolutely I love that. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for taking time to connect with PCA's community, both again, you know, in Chicago and then also across the U.S. and beyond where people are tuning in. And we'll look forward to seeing you back out on the field whenever that is. Um, and just want to thank you again for your support of Positive Coaching Alliance and the Chicago Fire support of PCA. You guys are an awesome partner of our uh, chapter there in Chicago. And hopefully we can do this again soon and see you out in the field soon.
Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to share my story. And thanks to everyone who followed online. Uh, we really appreciate your support. All the Chicago fans and all the clubs I played at in Colorado and Seattle and everywhere in Montreal. So I truly appreciate all your support. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thanks, Kate.